Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains! <laughs> and today... We are going to discuss more mad, unspeakable, scientific progress. Back to locomotives, though. These are five locomotives that are clearly just mad science experiments. Part three! The Pearson Nine-Foot Single. What? Why? Why would you do that? Why would you ever do that? James Pearson was a locomotive superintendent of the Bristol and Exeter Railway, a railway in the UK that actually later became part of the Great Western Railway. And he designed this 424 Express tank engine, of which eight of them were built in 1853 and 1854 by Rothwell of Bolton. For the time period, this thing was enormous. The most obvious glaring feature of it was the nine-foot diameter driving wheel, which was also flangeless. Now, it isn't necessarily the largest diameter wheel ever, but it was still pretty big, especially for that time. In fact, the locomotive itself was a mammoth. Not only was it insanely tall to deal with the wheel, but it was a broad gauge locomotive running on seven-foot rails, and it weighed 42 tons. But apparently it worked, at least somewhat. They were fairly fast, despite only having one driving wheel. That would have limited their tractive effort, but it was a really, really, really big wheel, to be fair. It also had a really short smoke box, and the ends of the cylinders can be seen protruding ahead of it. The suspension for the enormous driver was actually a really weird arrangement, too. It had four India rubber discs on each side of each wheel. The wheel load was then transferred via thin vertical rods to large brackets riveted to the top of the boiler. That sounds bizarre, because it is. The boiler then passed the load to the inside frames. It's not clear whether this particular design ever gave trouble, because there really isn't that much information regarding the performance of these engines, other than the fact that they were pretty fast. One allegedly reached 81.8 miles per hour down the Wellington Bank in Somerset. It's not exactly a verified thing, but going downhill, it may have been able to pull that off. But they only lasted about 16 years or so, which implies they probably weren't that great in the grand scheme of things. It's likely it's back to the adhesion issue. They only had one driver, so their pulling power was probably pretty limited. Also, based on sources, they were kind of scrapped more than once. I know, that's weird, but... Uh, Apparently, all eight were scrapped between 1868 and 1873, but they were rebuilt when B&E was absorbed by Great Western in 1876, and then they were rebuilt again as tender engines, with the wheels reduced to eight foot in diameter. Apparently, in that form, they actually did a lot better, interestingly enough, but they were finally put out of service entirely when broad gauge was abolished in 1892, thus making it so that they couldn't run at all without another extensive rebuild. And after that, it seems they were all simply scrapped. The Flamin Boiler. What is the... Why are you... Who did it? Oh, it was the French. But it was built by Flamin, who started his career in Belgium. Of course it was you two. Who else would it be? But in their defense, in this case, at least this one actually worked. See, the idea of this particular bizarre design was that it was a means of getting more boiler evaporating surface into a given load gauge. In a normal boiler, the two functions of evaporation and storage of steam above the water level are combined. Flamin, who was an engineer of the French Est Railway, was to separate the two functions entirely and therefore fit two cylindrical structures on the locomotive, one on top of the other. The lower was the normal regular boiler, which would be completely filled with water and fire tubes, but the other cylinder that sat above was specifically 
to act as a steam reservoir, which absorbed the steam coming out of the boiler through several large vertical tubes. It sounds pretty simple in that regard, but the effect was that there was simply more space for steam in a smaller area. There were actually multiple different locomotives that utilized this exact setup, and despite its bizarre appearance, it did actually work. So then that kind of leads into the question of, um, <clears throat> why wasn't it more prevalent? If it was effective in doing what it was supposed to do, why wouldn't more people use it? Well, that seems to be down to advances in other areas. Other countries were able to design sufficiently powerful locomotives without the extra design elements of the flam and boiler. It was more complicated to construct because of the design. It wasn't that complex, but it was still more complex than a typical boiler. No one really seemed keen to utilize it when they could get what they needed out of the locomotives without it. And most examples seem to have been scrapped by the early 1900s. The Fink System. What? No, no. Fink, I don't know what you're up to here, but it's time to stop because there are too many directions that this could, no, 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 no. Several locomotives were built to test this particular design as the Fink system does in fact refer to the very, very, very bizarre side rod arrangement we have going on here. It was actually developed, believe it or not, as a method of articulation, which doesn't seem like it makes any sense by looking at it, but let me try to explain how this was supposed to work. Pius Fink developed these particular locomotives between 1862 and 1867 for a standard gauge for the Steerdorfer Montenbahn Railway. That's in what is now Romania, but back then it would have been the Austro-Hungarian Empire. In any event, it was a very mountainous region and a very demanding line as a result. The first locomotive was built by Stotz Eisenbahn Gesselschaft and carried the number 500. It was named Steerdorf. The way the system worked was, um, <clears throat> bizarre, as you could probably imagine. The boiler was carried by three forward axles fixed to it, driven conventionally by two cylinders at the front. That part isn't particularly unusual. The firebox itself rested on a roller on the Zudo tender, they were basically tank engines, which held the two rearmost axles, which could swivel with respect to the front section. By the time they reached number 502, there were some slight differences in the design. There's an extra link on the Fink mechanism, and the system itself is based on driving the two rear axles on their swiveling frame from a countershaft, which was driven from the main driving wheels by a connecting rod. This countershaft remained parallel to the front axles, but was moved back and forth by the struts that were attached to the rearmost of the front three axles. Though the intention was to give the locomotive some method of slight articulation, the end result was not really that at all. In 502's case, the Fink system was not kinematically correct. The geometry of the mechanism couldn't actually properly compensate for the angular movement on curves. So it basically couldn't do exactly the thing it was supposed to do. Fink himself stated that it was an error that he had made by only one millimeter. But when it comes to building anything, engineering anything, one millimeter of error is actually quite a bit and can be cataclysmic in some applications. In this case, it made it so that it simply didn't really work that well. Coping with this error resulted in a lot of stress on other parts, which had to be strengthened. But those modifications wouldn't have actually corrected the issue at all, which doesn't really make sense. Like, if you knew what the problem was, why not correct the actual problem, not just put a bunch of band-aids on it, which it sounds like is exactly what they were doing. None of the Fink locomotives were considered satisfactory, like, at all. And the bizarre system wasn't even their only problem. See, there was another issue. Since these were basically tank engines, they kind of had a problem where as they consumed coal and water, it reduced their adhesion weight on the rails. That's not unusual for a tank engine, but apparently it was really bad for them because without their coal and water, they were actually very, very light and they couldn't perform as they were required whenever they ran out of anything or even ran low on anything. 
they actually were given tenders. Another band-aid fix, but, you know, whatever. The point is the Finx were not very successful, and yeah, they were all scrapped. The Baldwin Shea. Wait, a Shea? Baldwin made a Shea? Well, once. And it's only a Shea in the most technical sense. In terms of function, it worked the same way. It was a geared locomotive, and it used three different cylinders to move a crankshaft and move the wheels, etc, etc. If you're a rail fan, you may already know what a Shea is, and I have mentioned them in earlier videos. But um, Baldwin's take on a Shea was weird. And I mean really weird. And looking at it, I think the idea here was to make it different enough that they wouldn't have to pay for utilizing the Shea patent, but still similar enough that it could perform just as well as a Shea. Now, on paper, that's great, but their modifications were just so dumb, which is not something I get to say very often about Baldwin and steam locomotives. They were genuinely good at making steam locomotives. Apparently not geared ones. They actually only ever made five geared steam locomotive designs, and this one was the only Shea. But the cylinders weren't mounted vertically on the side like with every other Shea on the planet. Instead, they were mounted underneath horizontally, perpendicular to the boiler, right near the firebox, actually. This is otherwise known as the worst possible place you could put the cylinders. That's a terrible spot for multiple reasons. For one thing, the boiler and firebox get hot, and the heat causes the cylinders to wear much more quickly. Also, fireboxes are dirty, because ashes and stuff, and that would also be bad for the cylinders. And then, and then there's the other minor issue of having to maintain the cylinders that are, of course, going bad much more quickly than they otherwise would, and they're underneath the locomotive! How is anyone supposed to fix it easily? The answer is nobody. Nobody was ever supposed to do that. This was nearly impossible to work with. It's ridiculous. Absurd. I can't even believe they built one. They did, but no one ever bought it. Not one. There was only one built, and no one purchased it, and there were no orders. Which, yeah, duh. It just looks ridiculous. Of course they didn't buy it. Why would they purchase this over a regular Shea, which does literally the same thing, but with much easier maintenance and longevity. It was literally worse in every conceivable way, and it was only so, I presume, again, I can't confirm this, but it seems the only likely case is that Baldwin was just trying to dodge a patent fee. I can't say I blame them for that, but I can blame them for this. The H02 German High Pressure Steam Locomotive. Ah, uh, yes, bear witness to this precision German engineering. Look at that beast. Look at that madness. The HO2 was not the first high pressure steam locomotive that Germany worked on, but it's one of the more interesting ones. For one thing, the steam was delivered to the cylinders at no less than, I want to stress this, 1,750 pounds per square inch. What? The absolute madman what? Are you kidding me? That's the minimum, by the way. Which means this thing regularly operated at a PSI that was above the Fury. And I thought that one was about as high as these high pressure steam locomotives ever got. It went into these two really small outside cylinders, which were 220 millimeters in diameter. It was delivered in 1930 by Schwarzkopf. Apparently Schwarzkopf were really, really confident in this Insano design because they actually put a guarantee in the purchase contract of a coal savings of 42% on the thing. Now, I want to warn you, the way this thing worked is not at all like a typical steam locomotive or even a typical high-pressure steam locomotive. The way they handled it was weird. Really, really weird. This is peak mad science, okay? Let me try to explain this. And I stress, try, because there's a lot of big words you're about to deal with, and a lot of things you may not be able to keep track of, but I'm gonna do my best to dumb it down for you. It used steam alone to transfer the heat, as steam itself doesn't leave scale deposits. Saturated steam from the steam generator was pumped through the high-pressure superheater tubes which lined the firebox. There, it was superheated to about eh, 900 degrees Fahrenheit, 
and the pressure there was raised to 1,700 psi. But only a quarter of that was fed to the high-pressure cylinders. The rest was returned to the steam generator to evaporate more water and continue the cycle. The high-pressure cylinder exhaust passed through the oil separator, then the low-pressure feed heater, and finally the tubes of the low-pressure boiler. The boiler itself was not heated by combustion gases at all. It was strictly the steam. The steam there was only raised to 225 psi, then it was fed to the low-pressure superheater, and then fed via the low-pressure regulator to the low-pressure cylinder. The low-pressure exhaust feeds the blast pipe in the smoke box. The high-pressure exhaust, condensed in the low-pressure boiler heating tubes, was pumped back to the steam generator. That sounds really, really, really nuts, but basically how it worked is that it was using the steam itself to heat the boiler, not combustion gases at all. Now, in its way, it was kind of genius, but the problem here is that it was impossible to raise the steam at all in this locomotive unless you already had steam available, which you may recognize as what is supposed to be done in any steam locomotive. In order to get this thing going, you had to get steam from outside of it and introduce it to the system. You couldn't actually make steam in the locomotive itself. The firebox tubes were cooled by the steam and not water. So the minimum pressure in the steam generator before the fire could even be lit at all was 70 PSI. Now steam of course could be introduced from another locomotive, and in fact it was designed to do that, but what? Why? No, that's not the point of- it shouldn't need a separate locomotive in order to do that though. Plus, in this setup, you are absolutely 100% no question about it, no seriously, you need it dependent on a steam pump to keep the whole thing running. It was given two of these, since the designers must have known that, but they were still notoriously unreliable. Breakdowns were frequent, and the complex nature of the system made maintenance costs obnoxiously high. It was so expensive to work with. As it turned out, the increase in efficiency wasn't even worth it in any way. It was technically more efficient, yeah, but only by a little bit, and compared to the outrageously increased costs of maintaining it, it was completely worthless. And it broke down all the time. Like, like I said. There was only one example built, and it wound up being scrapped. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, some do 267, Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Blow Hawth 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 191-232, Mr. Black Rose, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Travel Typhoon, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian, Jack Carson's Rare Videos, Major Klutz, Hayden DeGrow, Master of None, Dr. Racer78, Crystal Morgan, Ohio Trucker 1, and Amtrak 2023 Productions. Till next time, this is Darkness, individual fond farewell.